Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in the Lord for this day in which he's brought us all together and made us of one heart and one mind and one spirit to glorify his holy name and to take pleasure in each other's company as we raise our voices to him together. On this day, we celebrate, actually, a day ago, the feast of the uh, holy, our Holy Father, St. Piman, the pastor from the Kiev Caves. And today we have the relics of St. Piman in our midst. And this is a precious gift to us because it helps to bring alive the understanding of these saints whom we commemorate as our older brothers and sisters in the faith. St. Piman was distinguished above all else for his unselfish love for the brotherhood. He was a great and very strict pastor, but he also had energy to work and to serve the brothers. And he would work day and night, everything that was possible to fulfill his obediences, to keep his prayers, and in every way to struggle to make the life of the rest of the brotherhood easier and better. He constantly showed love for everyone who came to the monastery and made no distinction about anyone, whether of their rank or who they were, what positions they held in the world, even those who were of the nobility who had come. He was, would receive all equally. He ground flour to make the bread for the monks in the monastery and sometimes baked the bread. But in, what really distinguishes him above all is that unselfish love and that lack of ego that he had which caused him to become radiant in the grace of the Holy Spirit. When we listen to the reading of the Holy Gospel this day, we, and the Apostle as well, we see an example of exactly the same thing. For in the Apostle reading, Apostle Paul is especially mentioning and singling out those who showed the greatest love for others and really an unselfish love. Those who would give and never think twice about the fact that they had given, but would reach out to all who were in need and respond to everyone's suffering, everyone's hunger, and really minister to Apostle Paul as well. And this is the thing that we have to look at to understand fully and completely the reading of the Gospel today. Because the gospel today is talking about greed that is born of ego. And egoism, self-centeredness, and self-love. How many times we stand here and in the sermons and in the gospel, we find exactly the same message and we repeat it over and over again. That the root of all of the evil that befalls humanity from other human beings of every war, of every enmity, of every bitterness, of every refusal to forgive, of every holding of grudge, and of every destruction of other human beings. All of these things flow out of egotism, self-centeredness, and self-love. Because this is truly the, the meaning of what happened in the Garden of Eden, when mankind fell from a condition of unselfish love into a condition of ego, self-centeredness, self-love. And the very first act after that fall was one brother murdering another brother because of his ego. And this is exactly what the Gospel is talking about today. In early times, the great vineyards which would be planted by a, a person who owned a lot of land would always be leased out. And the master who owned the land would always sin to receive the first fruits and receive his portion of the crop, which would be sold. And this is how he made his income. And in this parable, because the landowner had gone away to a distant place, those who had leased the land began to act as if they were the lords of the land itself. And when the master sent those to gather his portion of the, of the fruits, which were legally and lawfully and morally due to him, they decided they didn't want to share the crop because their ego, again, and their own self-centeredness had overpowered their sense of decency and justice and of what was right to be done. 
And this is the same thing that happened to Israel itself. They didn't want to render to God his fruits in due season and to receive the Son of God who came to them. And what were the fruits that God required of mankind? If not, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love the Lord our God with all of our being. And to love our neighbor as ourself can only mean that we have empathy for our neighbor. There's no other way to love our neighbor except to recognize that his suffering is the same as mine, the things that cause me pain cause him pain. The things that cause me grief causes her grief. And we struggle to keep from causing grief, suffering, or pain to other people because we have empathy, because we feel the same suffering and pain that they have. Why should we persecute someone when we know that the persecution is going to wound them and hurt them and cause them suffering? Why should we condemn another person when we can simply show them that we receive everyone equally, regardless of who they are, without any judgment of person. And in that way, we can embrace them with a kind of unselfish love that helps to heal their suffering instead of making it worse. And this is what the Gospel is really teaching us, and it is so often the forgotten part of the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the real ministry that we're supposed to fulfill in this world. We are supposed to be here not to think that we've become more righteous than everyone else in the world or that we're better than others. We've come here to help to re-sanctify this world in which we live and to try to develop that kind of healing, unselfish love for others that drives out the fear we have of others and that causes us to open our heart to them and recognizing that they may be different from us but their suffering is the same. They may not be the same as we are but their grief and sorrow are the same as ours. And to stop and think sometimes when our Lord Jesus Christ said to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, this wasn't a new saying. It was something that the rabbis had been saying and the priest had been saying for a thousand years in Israel and elsewhere in the world as well. Because when we do to others what we would have them do to us, whatever we do, whatever we say, however we act toward another person, we weigh it in our mind and say, would this hurt me if someone did it to me? Would this cause me suffering if someone did it to me? Would this rob me of my lawful self-esteem if someone did it to me? Would this degrade or humiliate me if someone did it to me? And if so, why on earth would you do it to someone else? This is really at the very root, at the very heart of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And above all things, we have to weigh those great moral imperatives, that is, the great moral actions that Christ commanded of us. And what were they? That we love our neighbor as ourselves and that we do to others only those things which we would that others would do unto us. And if our Lord Jesus Christ said that on, the, on the, the commandment to love our neighbor and the commandment to love God with all of our heart, this is the whole of the law and the prophet. So how dare we look at the Old Testament law or any other form of law when we judge our neighbors or our brothers and our sisters or when we interrelate with other human beings? when the entire law and the prophet are comprehended in simply those words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we love our neighbor as ourselves, that we receive everyone equally, and that we strive with all of our heart never to do anything to anyone else that we would not want them to do to us. A murderer does not want to be murdered. A thief does not want people to steal from him. Somebody who's a racist doesn't want other people to be racist toward him. Someone who wants to persecute or harm somebody else does not want someone to persecute or harm him. So why on earth would we, who profess to be followers of our Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel, ever do any of those things ourselves? Brothers and sisters,